This is Jonathan Ferguson, the keeper of firearms and artillery at the Royal Armouries Museum in the UK, which houses a collection of thousands of iconic weapons from throughout history. And this time, since so many of you asked so nicely in the last episode, Jonathan is checking out even more of the weapons from Rainbow Six Siege. Bleh. All right, I'm gonna have to pause it there. What on earth is that? If there are any other games, guns, and mechanics that you guys want to see Jonathan break down, let us know in the comment section below. Be sure to subscribe for more videos like this one, and if you'd like to help out the Royal Armouries Museum and continue to support Jonathan's work, check out the links in the description of this video. Right, over to Jonathan. Wow, that really, they're not wrong with the name. Super Shorty, it is. In fact, super short. I mean, usably short, I think. If you if you want it for blowing hinges off doors, short enough that you're gonna get enough pressure to actually damage and all blow away the hinges. I wouldn't like to rely on something that short for any practical purpose. Apart from anything, you're only gonna fit two rounds into that magazine tube. We get a third round out of it by chamber loading, which was, you'll see a lot of people do with tactical shotguns or competition shotguns as well. So they'll load the first round via the ejection port. Advantage to that, of course, is you've got a round in the chamber right away. So if you're set upon, <laughs> you could fire that round uh, and you don't have to carry on loading the magazine tube. The base weapon is a Remington 870 and it has a sort of side grade kit involving a, a pistol grip, no butt stock and a stop ridge pump grip. Not a bad idea, because with a barrel that short, you've got a reasonable chance of blowing all your fingers off if you slip off the front of the pump grip, so that big flange is a very good idea. The real downside for combat use, apart from it being pump action and therefore slow, is the lack of a buttstock. I mean, that just drastically hampers your ability to aim. The V308, V as in vector, but 308 as in 0 0.308 of an inch. And if you look at the side of it, it says 7.62 NATO. The vector was designed as a pistol caliber submachine gun or carbine, depending whether it's semi-automatic or, or select fire like this one. And it makes a certain amount of sense in that configuration. Pistol cartridges are relatively low recoil. The Super V system in there that redirects the recoil downwards helps keep the muzzle rise to a minimum and somewhat reduce felt recoil. That works with pistol calibers. It wouldn't work with 7.62. There is no Chris in 7.62 NATO. I don't know whose idea this was. I don't know why it's in the game. Making it extra ridiculous <laughs> is the drum mag. Looks like a Surefire style drum mag. The size of the cartridge means it's got a big a longer, heavier barrel on it as well. Overall then, a existing wacky submachine gun turned into a very wacky assault rifle. The other aspect to this that's a bit of a, a rabbit hole to go down is whether you could even build a 7.62 version of this design. The way this V-shaped bolt is designed, I don't think there'd be room even in this stretched version for it to actually function correctly. I'll give them some, some credit for the way it's depicted in use because it does kind of look like the player is hanging on for dear life when this thing shoots. <laughs> Something we see quite a bit in this game with its destructible environments, which I think are, are really quite impressive by the way. The level of destruction and the sort of tactical opportunities that opens up were definitely the high point for me when I did attempt to play the game some years ago. There are consequences for that in real life and there's a reason why we have dedicated breaching tools. Firearms are not usually the best way to get through these things. What we see in the game where the butt of a rifle is being used to smash through some really quite solid bits of wood, I don't think that would be feasible in, in many situations that, that I've seen in the, vid, in the footage and I remember from playing. If you were to try and use it as a bludgeon to get through a plank of wood, it may or may not survive. And if it doesn't survive, your rifle might be harder to aim. And if it's an AR, an Armalite based system with a buffer tube and a spring inside that butt stock, you might have actually prevented your rifle from functioning if you managed to bend the buffer tube. Now you'd have to hit something really hard with a rifle to achieve that, but then you'd, to get through a wooden plank, you'd have to hit really, really hard. If, if you could achieve it, you'd do your weapon some serious harm in the process.
We've got a SPAS 15, follow up to the SPAS 12, of course, which was a more of a traditional shotgun tube fed design. The 15 is clearly a box magazine fed, more aping the ergonomics of the famous AR-15. I mean, to be fair, being a, a fairly tactical, breaching through doors, not just a straight run and gun type game, there would have been room there for using the manual pump if you were going to switch ammunition to, say, a breaching round that might not have the, the force to cycle the semi-automatic mechanism, which is really the idea behind having either manual or pump. It's so that you can default to manual operation if you have a certain type of ammunition. So they could actually have implemented that, but I don't think they have. And they've just turned it into a semi-automatic only which is a, an interesting reversal from Hollywood, where if a shotgun's capable of both, they nearly always use it manually, possibly to do with reliability of cycling with blanks, mainly to do with how cool it looks. I'm thinking in particular here of Trinity with her SPAS-12 in The Matrix, where that whole scene would have been less cool if it wasn't getting pumped. <laughs> Iron sight view, if you like, of, of this is quite an interesting one. The rear sight is deliberately mounted very far down the carrying handle because sights that are close together are great for quick aiming, for snap shooting. Weapons intended for sort of short to medium range benefit from a shorter sight radius. It does, in theory, negatively affect accuracy at longer ranges because you've got less fine adjustment by having them closer together, that each movement you make is slightly more magnified effectively. Something to note, I think, in terms of this being a shotgun and shotguns having their tactical role is where we, we see a big old hole getting blown through this wooden wall here. Blowing a hole through a wall and then shooting people through it isn't necessarily the uh, SOP for, for a SWAT team or something, but it does speak to the ability of a 12 gauge shotgun to breach. So to blow a lock out, blow a hinge out, perhaps even help make entry if you if you have to, if you haven't got breaching charges or a sledgehammer, famously. If you had to, you could use potentially a shotgun to do it. Don't try this at home though. We're dealing here clearly with a French GIGN operator with a ballistic shield and he has a revolver. And I believe they have stopped using revolvers now. But they were certainly using them into the turn of the millennium in contrast to just about every other special forces unit in the world. It was almost like a badge of um, identity, of honor, that they were using these uh, really nicely made um, manual revolvers, which is what this should be the MR37, but it's not. It's a Smith & Wesson 586, so it's an American equivalent to the correct French revolver. Now, if this was a low-budget movie or something, or one film somewhere where they couldn't get the manual, I'd say fair enough. But as this is a virtual environment, I'm gonna say, why didn't you use the MR73? Because <laughs> that's, what, that's what he should have. Now, in the middle of a blazing firefight in Siege, you're not gonna be able to really tell the difference anyway, but this is what it should be. Very, very similar. Also 357 Magnum. Kind of bizarre that it's still in use as late as it was, being that it's only six rounds and a modern self-loading pistol. Well, take your pick, anything from 15 to 20 rounds now. But for certain applications at least, this was still in use until really quite recently. And I'm sure they still have them in the armories. Come to think of it, I don't know that I've seen one of these in a video game. So if I'm right, somebody please put one in a game because they're, they're really cool. <laughs> Accessorizing revolvers is tricky. They're old technology. They weren't designed for sights and lasers and stuff like that. If you wanted a scope, you had to have a sort of a dovetail mount adapted. And as for lasers, there isn't really anywhere to mount them. We've seen grips that have a little laser built in. So when you squeeze the grip, the laser comes on. What we've got in Siege is a quite old fashioned way of mounting a laser. So you would literally put a hole in the front of the trigger guard. Wouldn't dream of it on this. This <laughs> too much of a sort of collector piece, really. And you clamp on, hoping that the angle works with it, a sort of kit and then a wire that would run around the trigger guard or along the frame to the grip. And then when you grip the grip, the laser would come on and it's, so it's sticking out of the front of the trigger guard. So that's not been invented by the developers of this game. That is a, a, an old school way of mounting a laser to a gun that wasn't designed to have one. Gotcha. 
Right. Well, the name says C8 SFW, SFW being Special Forces Weapon, a specific variant of the C8 Carbine, Canadian equivalent to the US M4. So this um, C8 SFW that I'm holding here, this is from the Dutch contract from, from DeMarco for the Dutch military. What looks at first glance like quite a good attempt at what it's purporting to be, if you look at it with a nerdy eye, there's quite a lot wrong with it. The notches, if you like, on the on the accessory rail are far too far apart, all too spaced out, so the modeling's gone awry there. And then the real sore thumb is the barrel. The iconic SFW profile barrel is a sort of M16A2 profile, so a far cry from the original thin pencil barrel of the M16 or of the original C7 and C8 rifles. Now there are shorter barrel C8s. What we've got here is neither fish nor fowl. It's all a bit confusing. Slightly unusually, because I don't believe Canadian forces use the, the M26, we have the American M26 modular shotgun system. So this thing is meant to be either mounted to a, a weapon, as we see here, or fitted to a standalone grip stock to use as a, a sort of handy light breaching shotgun. And of course you could use it for combat in a pinch, but that's not really what it's for. Uh, that short barrel isn't going to be developing perhaps enough velocity for reliable combat use. That's not really what it's for. It's meant for getting through doors primarily. That, those are some mighty big holes for such a small shotgun. You're firing most likely buckshot and the holes created in that sort of drywall or whatever it is are absolutely immense. I don't think the physics would allow for that. But equally, you probably don't want to be stood there for five minutes while you manually blow a hole through a wall with a <laughs> shotgun in a game. That's uh, a compromise that they've made. One op four remaining. Op four eliminated. This is a really odd choice, I think. I think it's the Magpul version, the FMG9, which was a folding submachine gun designed to fold into a rectangular block. The very first, or possibly the second version, appears in Robocop 2. Point being, this is meant to be like the ultimate concealed submachine gun. It folds pretty much in half. The magazine in the grip folds up and then the whole thing folds together so it's like a nice compact blocky item. The problem with anything like that is the time it takes you to deploy it versus just lifting a gun gun up from a sling or pulling it out from a hip holster or something like that. Folding guns don't make a great deal of sense, certainly not for this kind of role. More strange than that I think is that the game doesn't even acknowledge the folding aspect of the gun. You don't even get a cool flippy spinny unfoldy animation as, as the gun is readied. It just comes up and if you didn't look it up or didn't know about what it was, you would just think it was a weird looking submachine gun. I don't really know why they chose it. Maybe they had um, specific plans for it that were more interactive, I don't know. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't really make in-game sense to me. Blah! What in the hell? All right, gonna have to pause it there. What on earth is that? <laughs> Next up is the Mark 17 CQB, Mark 17 being the US military designation for the SCAR Heavy, the Special Forces Combat Assault Rifle. The F is silent. And quite what a combat assault rifle is supposed to be, I'm not quite sure. Well, I am sure. Someone desperately wanted the acronym to spell SCAR, because it's manly, I suppose. So the idea here would be the punch of 7.62 with the compactness of something more the size of an M4 or even shorter actually, more like a Mark 18. So it does, it fits it very much the mold of a modern Rainbow Six game. Not at all surprised to see it here. One of the first several firearms to introduce this idea of not black, solid black coloration actually not being great for camouflage. You're much better off with a, a greenish color. This sort of mishmash of different shades of brown, this is actually what they look like. They're very rarely one solid color because the different finishes, the different materials end up looking different. They reflect, reflect the light differently, apart from anything else. But I've been doing this for perhaps 12 years in a, in a professional capacity and I have never once seen, even as an idea, this style of ballistic shield where it's just a transparent piece of plexiglass or, or ballistic 
glass, whatever this is meant to be, that attaches to the rifle directly. The great benefit would be that it gives you a great field of view, not interrupted by Kevlar or ceramic or steel or whatever you would normally use for a ballistic shield. The massive downside is how incredibly unwieldy this would make the weapon. We, we constantly struggle to add functionality to, to firearms to make them more capable whilst keeping weight down and strapping a bit of double glazing to your rifle seems like a spectacularly poor idea. You either want a ballistic shield, a kind of full height or maybe even a half height one to give you co full coverage of your torso at least, or you want a rifle. You don't want a rifle and a ballistic shield combined. It's been tried, and when I say it's been tried, it's been tried as far back as the 1530s with gun shields that were purchased by, among others, Henry VIII. We have quite a few in our collection, and they are iron or steel and wood shields with a matchlock breech-loading gun mounted in the middle of them. And those didn't catch on for very good reason, and this wouldn't either. I'm pausing again. Now I've seen it in action, I'm even less convinced. So it's got some sort of estimation marks down the side. I don't know what they're for. Answers on a postcard. And then when it gets hit, rather than take impacts and kind of spider or take damage but still be there, it just kind of shatters into, into oblivion and you no longer have it. It's, it's one of the more bizarre things I've seen in a supposedly somewhat realistic <laughs> Uh, first person shooter. If anyone has seen any real world inspiration for this, please put it in the comments because I'm kind of fascinated, but at the same time slightly afraid to see it. That is a take on the H&K grenade launcher adopted in the US as the M320 and it's in its standalone configuration with a buttstock and a, and a pistol grip, which is increasingly how these formerly mostly under barrel launchers are being used. Rather than unbalance and, and make heavier the gun, you sling it or even holster it as a separate weapon and you use it as needed and then you, have, you go back to your rifle. I don't have one to compare, there's something not quite right about the configuration of that. The sights don't look as I remember seeing one. Stranger than that are the munitions being used there. Now I believe that's some form of breaching ammunition where it somehow burrows into a breachable wooden structure or whatever, whatever it happens to be and then blows up after a delay so it's just almost like a remote breaching shotgun. Interesting idea. I'm not aware of any real ammunition like that existing though. I think it would be really quite problematic to get to work and quite dangerous if it didn't work. There's not really a need. If you're breaching, they don't know you're there. So you get as close as you need to. You shouldn't really need to breach from a distance. But I don't do this for a living. So <laughs> maybe that's been mooted in some um, concept way, but I'd, I'd be surprised. For those of you wondering what this funny looking beige MP5 is, this is the MLI, Midlife Improvement Configuration for the MP5. So this isn't a third party manufacturer or an aftermarket accessory kit. This is Heckler & Koch trying to keep their 1960s vintage MP5 relevant. Some would say that they should be doing that by adding a bolt hold open device so that you don't have to do the rather slow HK reload with the old slap that we've, <laughs> we know and love. So the changes are to do with accessories, but other than the, the cosmetic change of making it fashionable and brown. <laughs> so the gun hasn't changed. They're just finishing them in a, in a different color, fitting a, an accessory handguard, fitting a rail, a rail adapter, still got the old iron sights on there. And in fact, the same claw mount mounting system underneath, but rather a cost-effective way to keep the MP5 somewhat competitive with modern submachine guns. But they could they could perhaps have gone further with that to keep it in the race. But then submachine guns are not widely purchased for this kind of role anymore. You're better off with a an intermediate rifle caliber, really, for most applications. But the MP5 is an absolute classic. I can't help feeling that HK have ruined the uh, aesthetic appeal of it with this update. We can't blame Siege for that.
Right, a shotgun, clearly. I'm not super hot on over under 12 gauge shotguns, I must admit. They're really more of a sporting gun. This is over and under, which I guess makes it look a bit more tactical than a side by side, but really, a gun like this has no place in a tactical shooter, as far as I'm concerned. Two shots, cumbersome reload for the type of application that, that's being used for. When this thing is reloaded, if the player has only fired one round, it will only eject the fired case. There's some clever mechanical jiggery pokery going on in there that will only punt out the fired case. So that, although it might look like a mistake, is definitely not. There's a nice touch when this thing is opened up because you can see the sort of decorative pattern of polishing that's done to the breech end of the barrels. So that's something you'd see on a relatively decent sporting shotgun, which presumably this is supposed to be, although you wouldn't normally see it on one with black polymer tactical looking furniture. Someone has to annoy slash amuse me, put an ACOG for power <laughs> optical sight on this thing. Why uh, you, would, you wouldn't do that. Major issue, of course, is the magnification you're, you're, and the field of view for trying to look through this and use it at close range. Try walking around your house with a pair of binoculars <laughs> in front of your eyes. So I'm not really the biggest fan of this thing. So this thing's supposed to be firing 12 gauge slugs, and I think it does a reasonable depiction of that. If you were fighting at close quarters with a shotgun, something like buckshot would seem to me to make more sense. The slug is devastating, don't get me wrong. The idea of slugs, as far as I'm aware, was for one thing, shooting engine blocks on cars and for longer range. I'm not entirely sure that slugs would be the choice if you were using a shotgun in this situation, but we really are in fantasy land here. Thanks very much for watching the Firearms of Rainbow Six Siege. Please join us again next time here at GameSpot. Also, we at the Royal Armouries have our own YouTube channel. Do go and check that out. And as always, we'll have links in the description for ways that you can support the museum and keep us doing what we're doing. Thanks very much. Thank you.